He is hailed as the number one warrior of the Three Kingdoms era, the strongest one-on-one -on -one fighter, and the only character in various Three Kingdoms-themed films and TV series who is qualified to be outnumbered in a fight. Despite being renowned as Lu Bu among men, red hair among horses, he was also branded as brave, but tactless and treacherous. So, what was the real strength of Lu Bu in history? Was he truly the foremost warrior of the Three Kingdoms? Although Lu Bu's image varies greatly today, he did not use the Fang Tian Huaji halberd historically. The love story with Diao Chan is also fictional, as there was no such person as Diao Chan in history. The famous battle of the three heroes against Lu Bu never actually happened. If Lu Bu really faced Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei, he would likely have been defeated. However, his victory at the shooting of the halberd at Yuan Gate, causing Chao Chao repeated losses, and his ease in maneuvering his horse Red Hair among 10,000 Black Mountain troops, also speaks to his bravery. In this video, let me take you through the legendary life of Lu Bu. Lu Bu, styled Feng Xian, was born in Juyuan County, Wuyuan Commandery, Bing Province. Skilled in archery and horsemanship, and known for his valor and martial prowess, he served in Bing Province. In 189 AD, when Ding Yuan, the governor of Bing Province, was stationed in Henei, he noticed Lu Bu's proficiency in mounted combat and summoned him to serve as his chief clerk, treating Lu Bu with great favor. After the death of Emperor Ling of Han, Ding Yuan received a summons from He Jin to lead his troops to Luoyang to plot the extermination of the eunuchs. However, before they could act, He Jin was killed by the eunuchs. After Dong Zhuo entered the capital and seized power, he sought to eliminate Ding Yuan. He enticed Li Bu to murder Ding Yuan and annex his troops, for which Li Bu was rewarded with the appointment as Commandant of Qi Yi. To win over Lu Bu, Dong Zhuo even adopted him as a son. Li Bu, known for his extraordinary strength and skill in archery, was nicknamed the Flying General. Soon after, he was promoted by Dong Zhuo to Gentleman of the Palace and in Feoft as Marquis of Dutang. In 190 AD, during the campaign against Dong Zhuo by the coalition forces from Shandong, Li Bu indeed participated in the battle, but the episode of the three heroes fighting Li Bu did not occur. At that time, the brothers Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei were still under Gong Sun Zan, not yet qualified to join this coalition, and Cao Cao participated in the battle under the banner of another power. During the battle against the coalition, Li Bu was defeated by Sun Jian's forces due to discord with the general Hu Zhen, forcing Dong Zhuo to relocate the capital to Chang'an with Emperor Xi'an of Han. Aware of his own brutality, Dong Zhuo often had Li Bu serve as his personal guard for fear of assassination. Yet, Dong Zhuo's suspicious nature led him to once throw a halberd at Li Bu over a trivial displeasure. Li Bu, having an affair with one of Dong Zhuo's maidservants and fearing exposure, felt increasingly uneasy. This maidservant was the prototype for the fictional character Diao Chan. After harboring resentment against Dong Zhuo, Li Bu sought a confidant to express his discontent. Wang Yun, who had previously treated Li Bu with great respect due to his reputation as a strong warrior from Bing province, became Li Bu's first choice. Wang Yun, also troubled about how to eliminate Dong Zhuo, saw an opportunity when Li Bu approached him. Wang Yun wanted Li Bu to be an inside collaborator. Hesitant at first, Li Bu said, how can I lay hands on him as he is like a father to me? Wang Yun replied, General, your surname is Li, and you're not his biological son. Now, you should be more concerned about saving your own life than about father-son ties. Persuaded by Wang Yun, the initially reluctant Li Bu agreed and successfully assassinated Dong Zhuo. Afterwards, Li Bu was appointed as the general of vigorous courage, 
ennobled as Marquis of Wen and co-managed the government with Wang Yun. After Dong Zhuo's death, his former subordinates like Li Jue and Guo Xi, initially intending to disband their forces and retire to the mountains, encountered Jia Xu. Under Jia Xu's counsel, Li Jue and Guo Xi gathered their old troops and attacked the capital. Despite Li Bu's efforts to hold out for eight days, he had to escape with a few hundred cavalry, taking Dong Zhuo's head due to a mutiny among the city's defenders. During this time, Li Bu fought Guo Xi in single combat north of the city, even spearing him, but Guo Xi was rescued by his troops, leading to a ceasefire. After fleeing, Li Bu first sought refuge with Yuan Shu, who rejected him for being arrogantly self-important. Li Bu then turned to Yuan Shao. During their battle against Jiang Yan's Black Mountain Army in Changshan, facing over 10,000 infantry and several thousand cavalry, Li Bu often rode his exceptional horse, Red Hair, capable of leaping over walls and trenches. Alongside trusted warriors like Cheng Lian and Wei Yue, he would charge into Jiang Yan's formations multiple times a day, each time returning only after taking heads of the Black Mountain Army. After more than 10 days of continuous fighting, they finally defeated Jiang Yan's forces. After the battle, Li Bu, relying on his military achievements, again requested Yuan Shao to increase his forces. Yuan Shao refused, and Li Bu's soldiers began looting and plundering. Li Bu's actions soon drew Yuan Shao's displeasure. Feeling uneasy, Li Bu requested to return to Luoyang. Yuan Shao agreed, appointing Li Bu as the prefect of the Masters of Writing in the name of the Emperor and sending soldiers to secretly eliminate him. Suspecting Yuan Shao's intentions, Li Bu had someone play the zither in his tent while he quietly escaped. That night, the soldiers attacked Li Bu's bed with swords, thinking they had killed him. However, the next day Yuan Shao learned that Li Bu was still alive. So he ordered the city gates closed, but Li Bu managed to flee to Hainei and ally with Zhang Yang. Yuan Shao, fearing Li Bu's threat, sent troops after him, but they were too afraid to approach him. Passing through Chen Liu, the governor Zhang Miao welcomed Li Bu and treated him generously. Upon parting, the two men clasped each other's arms and swore friendship. In 194 AD, as Cao Cao attacked Tao Qian to the east, he assigned Chen Gong to guard Dong Jun. Chen Gong persuaded Zhang Miao, saying, The world is divided and heroes are rising. You have a force of a hundred thousand in a strategic location. You should be a hero among men, not controlled by others. Now, with the local troops away on the Eastern Campaign, the land is vulnerable. Li Bu is a valiant warrior, unbeatable in battle. If we invite him to jointly occupy Yanzhou, we can observe the situation and wait for the right moment. This could dominate the age. Zhang Miao heeded Chen Gong's advice and, along with his brother Zhang Chao and Chen Gong, welcomed Li Bu, seizing Puyang and becoming the new master of Yanzhou. The counties under Yanzhou responded in kind. Learning of this threat in his rear, Chao Chao led a large army to attack Li Bu. The Tian family in Puyang responded to Cao Chao, allowing his army to enter the city and set fire to the eastern city gate to encourage a decisive battle with Li Bu. However, Li Bu's cavalry quickly dispersed the Qingzhu soldiers, throwing Cao Cao's army into disarray. Li Bu's cavalry captured Cao Cao, but Cao Cao, pointing to a man on a yellow horse, claimed that was him, narrowly escaping capture. After several battles with no decisive outcome over more than 100 days, a drought occurred, leading to food shortages and locust plagues. With cannibalism emerging due to the famine, Li Bu finally moved his troops to Shanyang. In 195 AD, Li Bu and Chen Gong led an army of over 10,000 to attack Chao Chao. At that time, Chao Cao's soldiers were all out harvesting wheat 
leaving less than 1,000 men in the camp. Chao Cao, knowing it was difficult to defend the camp with just these men, ordered all women to guard the low walls of the camp and had the less than 1,000 soldiers appear at the edge of the camp, posing confidently. Li Bu, suspecting an ambush, retreated with his army over 10 miles away, missing another opportunity to capture Chao Cao. The next day, when Li Bu returned to challenge again, Chao Cao hid half of his soldiers behind a dike, while the other half were exposed outside, setting up a formation. When the battle ensued, Chao Cao's hidden troops emerged from behind the dike, launching a combined infantry and cavalry charge that severely defeated Li Bu's forces. After Li Bu's retreat, Chao Cao recaptured all the cities in Yanzhou, leaving Li Bu with no choice but to seek refuge with Li Bei. Also in 195 AD, Yuan Shu led his army to attack Shuzhou, facing off against Li Bei in Shuyi and Huayin, with varying outcomes. Yuan Shu then wrote to Li Bu, promising to send 200,000 hu of rice if he attacked Li Bei's stronghold in Xiapi. Tempted by the offer, Li Bu traveled eastward by water. When he was about 40 li from Xiapi, Li Bei's subordinate Xu Dan revealed to Li Bu that Jiang Fei and Chao Bao were at odds and Xiapi was in chaos. Xu Dan opened the city gates, allowing Li Bu's army to enter and swiftly defeat the forces left by Jiang Fei, capturing Li Bei's family and the families of his officers. Meanwhile, Liu Bei, defeated by Yuan Shu, fled to Haixi, exhausted and starving. He had no choice but to request surrender to Li Bu. Annoyed that Yuan Shu had stopped sending grain, Li Bu prepared carriages and horses to welcome Liu Bei, appointing him as the inspector of Yuzhou and stationing him at Xiaopei. Li Bu then declared himself the governor of Suzhou. In July of the same year, Due to the conflict between Li Ju and Guo Xi, Emperor Xi'an of Han left Chang'an to return eastward. Passing through Hedong, he issued an edict ordering Li Bu to escort him. However, Li Bu's army lacked sufficient food supplies to fulfill this royal command, leading Li Bu to send envoys to apologize for his inability to comply. The court then appointed Li Bu as the general who pacifies the East and ennobled him as the Marquis of Ping Tao. In 196 AD, Yuan Shu sent his general Ji Ling with over 30,000 cavalry and infantry to attack Liu Bei. Liu Bei sought Li Bu's assistance. To avoid the risk of being surrounded by Yuan Shu, should Liu Bei fall, Li Bu quickly led 1,000 infantry and 200 cavalry to Xiaopei. Hearing of Li Bu's arrival to aid Liu Bei, Ji Ling had to withdraw his forces, not daring to act rashly. However, unwilling to miss the opportunity to defeat Liu Bei and gain merit, Ji Ling invited Li Bu to drink together, during which the famous incident of shooting the halberd at the gate occurred, forcing Ji Ling to retreat. In 197 AD, Yuan Shu sought an alliance with Li Bu and proposed a marriage between his son and Li Bu's daughter, to which Li Bu happily agreed. However, Yuan Shu then sent envoys to formally convey his intention to declare himself emperor and requested to take Li Bu's daughter to complete the marriage. Chen Gui, the chancellor of Pei, worried that if Yuan Shu and Li Bu became in-laws, Zuzhou and Yangzhou would unite, posing a threat to the state. He thus persuaded Li Bu not to bear the stigma of allying with an unjust person. Influenced by Chen Gui's instigation, Li Bu also recalled Yuan Shu's previous snubbing, leading to a change in his stance. Consequently, Li Bu immediately sent troops to retrieve his daughter and had Yuan Shu's envoys shackled and beheaded as a public warning. After the success of this strategy, Chen Gui sent his son Chen Deng to Suchang to pay respects to Cao Cao. Chen Deng portrayed Li Bu as brave but tactless and fickle, expressing hope that Cao Cao would eliminate him soon 
and offering to act as an inside agent. In 198 AD, Li Bu once again rebelled against the court and allied with Yuan Shu. He sent Gao Shun and Jiang Liao to attack Pei City, defeating Liu Bei. Consequently, Cao Cao personally led an army to attack Li Bu. Upon reaching Xiapi, Cao Cao sent a letter to Li Bu laying out the prospects of fortune and disaster. Li Bu considered surrendering, but Chen Gong and others, guilty of betraying Cao Cao, strongly opposed it and advised Li Bu to defend outside the city while they guarded the gates. They planned to attack Cao Cao's forces if they assaulted Li Bu and to rescue the city if Cao Cao laid siege. Li Bu agreed with this plan. However, Li Bu's wife questioned the loyalty of Chen Gong, who had abandoned Cao Cao despite his kindness. Li Bu abandoned the plan, but secretly sent envoys to Yuan Shu for help and led a cavalry sortie from the city, retreating back after a brief success. As Yuan Shu was unable to provide aid, Li Bu's subordinates, Ho Cheng, Song Xian, and Wei Shu, rebelled and captured Chen Gong, surrendering to Cao Cao. Under the pressure of Cao Cao's siege, Li Bu considered surrendering his head to Cao Cao, but his men, reluctant to do so, surrendered in December. Li Bu was bound and brought before Cao Cao. He asked to be unbound, but Cao Cao refused, saying, one cannot loosely bind a tiger. Li Bu proposed that with his cavalry and Cao Cao's infantry, they could conquer the land. Cao Cao was tempted, but Liu Bei reminded him of Li Bu's betrayals of Ding Yuan and Dong Zhuo. Before his death, Li Bu accused Liu Bei of being the least trustworthy. Eventually, Li Bu was strangled and then beheaded. His followers Chen Gong and Gao Shun were also executed for refusing to surrender, while Jiang Liao surrendered to Cao Cao. Cao Cao ordered the heads of Li Bu, Chen Gong, and Gao Shun to be sent to Su Chang to display his victory and then had them buried. With this, the once formidable Li Bu faction became a part of history's dust. That brings us to the end of our story about Li Bu, the legendary figure from the Three Kingdoms period. Known for his unparalleled martial prowess and bravery, Li Bu's life was riddled with betrayal and political turmoil. His story teaches us that mere martial strength is not enough to ensure lasting success. What are your thoughts on Li Bu? Do you see him as a true hero or as a traitor corrupted by power? Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below and like and subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on more fascinating historical content. See you in the next video.